experience here in this, in this church, because we, we put a lot of emphasis, <clears throat> is that in the presence of the God, there is something that can fulfill every part of us. Happiness sometimes is based upon our circumstances around us. And if you live only by circumstances around you, then you live in the happy. But the joy of the Lord is strength. It literally means the very essence of who God is, because his, his, who his presence is, is not only joy, but his joy is an anointing of spirit. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. The joy takes us somewhere. And so we can live in a fulfillment of the Lord that is joy, joyous, though circumstances around us may not be optimum because they can change. And we never want to live based upon the circumstantial things around us. We want to live from the inside out, which from the joy of the Lord causes us to see God the other play, from, from his perspective. When we only live by happiness, we are blinded to see what God has in store for us. Because joy is an anointing that breaks through all of the circumstances that we see, the facts and issues, and helps us look beyond that, where we're heading to and where we want to go to that. <clears throat> so there's, there's a real grace and anointing for understanding how to press into the presence of God. When you come into an environment like this, don't be an observer. Just lay down all the other stuff and pick it up on the way out. <clears throat> Hopefully you won't have to. But at that very moment, it's just you and the Lord. It's not about you thinking about how bad things are around you and if I had this and that or looking around and thinking, I wish I had that person's life or that person or what they're doing. Let me just tell you, a lot of our discernment is not being discerned by the Spirit. It's discerned out of our mind. We discern a lot of things out of our mind by perception, looking, and not by our spirit. And what I want to get into this morning is how to move from, from just a mindset into a spirit release. And I, I don't even know how I'm going to explain and really my revelations come to me in this way. But there's, there's a place in the Lord that I just recently kind of stepped into, certainly not there by any stretch, is that you can move from what you think and how you feel by the natural senses and that you can step into a realm that you look beyond the momentary light of fictions, light afflictions, and see the way to the way your glory of the Lord. Can you imagine that when Jesus, according to Philippians 2, he was all God, yet all man, yet he knew what was facing him and knew that he was setting himself up for the cross to come. He knew that he was going to be betrayed. There's emotional trauma there. Knowing the fact is what they were going to do to him, knowing that his close friends around him, Peter being one of them, were, were going to turn the back on them and deny who he was. Knowing all of these things, he enters into the Garden of Gethsemane, which was to fulfill all that Adam had failed in the Garden of Eden. And now he was in the Garden of Gethsemane alone. So much so that the capillaries of his body started breaking out and he was just sweating blood. The Roman soldiers comes in and, and knowing that that's what they're there for, this is the process, and there's Jesus saying, who are you looking for? In other words, I'll just make it easy for you. Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, here I am. I am a, a statement from God. I am that I am. I am here. What do they do? Boom, hit the ground. Because he says in John 14, the prince of this world's coming, but he finds nothing in me. So it's a really powerful statement when you consider what it means. It means the spirit of this world that's being motivated by all of the demonic forces around is coming to get me. But when they come to get me, there was nothing in me that will resonate in them. There is no point of agreement, homo legeo. There's nothing in me has the same spirit that's in them. So when there's nothing in them and in him that comes in agreement, they can't take him. So when we consider the enemy comes in, if there's nothing in us that's agreeing with that, they can't take you. So Jesus, after the third time they hit the deck, finally he lets them take him. So it has to be fulfilled. When he says in Hebrews, for the joy set before him, I mean, the fact is that the cross wasn't the joy, but there was something in his spirit, all God, all man, that he looked past what was happening at the moment and he could look through that and could see the Father. For the joy that was set before him, not the cross, 
but the joy that was set before him is, I'm going back to my father for the joy set before him. <clears throat> Jesus lived in such a place of recognizing the presence of God continually so that when he was on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was the first time that Jesus felt or understood that God had turned his back on him. The presence of God was so much around him that he felt for just that moment that something had happened that separated me from God, which was to fulfill that God could not look upon sin. He was the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. He was the scapegoat that was to be sent out in the wilderness, never to come back again. And when Jesus gave up the ghost, <clears throat> at that point, the joy that was set before him entering back in that place. I've been sharing for several weeks now that there's a place that we can come to the Lord, and it's certainly a place that we can not strive for, but we can be led there by the Holy Spirit in such a way that takes us out of looking through the fog of this world and being caught up in the, in the fear and the what ifs and maybe not, maybe this and maybe that and, and, and putting more, more credit to flesh and blood than what God really intends for it to be. Give more credit to mankind doing all the evil. And I mean, we've, there's plenty of evil. We saw it this last weekend in the schools there that the devil surely knows how to move in pe people's lives. But we understand that the, the power of de the darkness is already at work. We know that sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Grace is not just this, this only divine favor that I get warm fuzzies knowing that God's done for me. That's great. We were born again, saved by grace through faith. And so by grace, it means much more than that is the word caris, which is a gift of God, but it also means the power to get over something, the power to rise above something. When, Paul, when God tells Paul, my grace is sufficient to you three times, where Paul, the seasoned apostolic figure who had probably been the one who was caught up into heaven, saw things he could not even talk about, and yet Paul is struggling with this messenger of Satan. Meaning the fact is, he, su he knew more than most of us knows, but yet I've got this thing I'm dealing with. So he comes to the Lord and he say, asks him three times, would you deal with this messenger of Satan? Satan? And yet God says back to him, my grace is sufficient. <clears throat> In the natural, it makes it sound like God was blowing him off. <laughs> my grace is sufficient, Paul. Get over it. Just grin and bear it. Pick it up. Pull your boots up, man. Let's get on with it. But really what he was saying is, Everything that I have already given you necessary to overcome the messenger of Satan is already in you. My grace is already sufficient. It's already inside of you. Has to tell him three times for that. We don't know what all happened out of that or what the issue was, his sight or, or just harassment. But anyway, Paul had to reach from down inside of him and pull up from inside of him what he needed to destroy the works of the devil. When we begin to only, at, when we ask the Lord, God, would you need to do this? You need to do this. It would be like in some ways, and I'm not God sovereign. He can send however he wants to. He can send angels however he wants to do it. I'm not saying we shouldn't ask the Lord for it. Because in asking, he begins to reveal to us, I've already given it to you. It's already inside of me. It's already empowered to you. Which means the fact is we cannot become independent from God. Just because we have it. We need the working of the Holy Spirit to unlock or activate what has already been placed inside of us. And that's what I want to get into this morning, <clears throat> is how do we activate what's already put inside of us. He says that I've already given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. That's a big statement. Everything that life, meaning to live out here, and godliness, that, that having everything to life, is connected to that next part of that is godliness, or godlikeness. <clears throat> When the Genesis creation, when God said, let us make man, not in our image, but in our likeness, goes on to use the word likeness, two different words, they're an image that God doesn't look like us, but he literally put something inside of us of a spiritual nature, of a DNA that is him. But he uses another statement that in, like, in our likeness. The original says in, in the liking or what we like to do. 
So we would say today that God has, in the likeness means, I place something in you that you can think like and do like and be like him. Paul even says that we have the mind of Christ. These are all things out there in front of us, but the, the problem is that we know them theologically, but not too many Christians get there. There's a lot of things that we know theologically. I find people that have been in the ministry are the most difficult to probably deal with and work through that is because we have a lot of information but never walked out it, never walked it out fully. And so we can know all about it, know the right cliches, know the right things, and know the right scriptures to say and all that. But faith is not about the mantra that we repeatedly say. If you've ever been around, and I'm, I'm, I believe in faith, talk, walk, but if all I'm doing is saying, I'm blessed coming in, blessed going out, there's, you know, and, and all of those kind of things, and learn the right things to say, but it has not been revelation beyond my mindset and has never got inside to release the innermost being, then I live in a world of possibilities, but not in a spiritual reality. God wants to unlock what has been placed inside of us to a full dimension to where that we're operating in the power of the Spirit, not in the knowledge of our own inspiration. Now, I know there's all kinds of preaching, all kinds of ways that people deliver the Word. If all we do is inspire people, it, gets, it doesn't last past they leave the front door. But transformation moves from, man, I, I felt tingly or felt something good about that, to the point is the application is what's transformative. We know Johnny 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The only truth that makes us free is not the truth that I hear, but the truth that I apply. It's in the application that takes us into another level of glory. It's from glory to glory. So what I want to share this morning, I'm going to pick up out of Romans, the fourth chapter. You can get there. <clears throat> A number of years ago, several years ago, there was a man came to me for counseling, and I didn't know who he was, but he as a neighbor had suggested he comes talk with me many years ago. And he had been indicted and charged with a real, some heinous crimes related to children. I did the best I could to not want to choke him myself. And just to stay connected with the word. So after we talked for a little bit, and he, I could tell by his, his, his demeanor, his countenance, he didn't really understand fully what he had done. Because his background was that he had been molested with family members since he was a young boy. And he saw it as long as it stayed inside the home, it was a rites of passage. Some kind of weird sexuality. So he did not realize what you did is a felony, big felony. <clears throat> so I said, well, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? And he said, well, I know there's an entity out there, because I think I said God. He said that it's an entity out there because I look at creation and think somebody did this, something did this. So I see him as an entity. And I was getting a little bit frustrated with the idea of trying to, what am I going to do with this guy? And I asked him, I said, what do you do for a living? I, I, under my breath, I said, Holy Spirit, <laughs> help me. I don't know what to say to him. Because there's a part of me emotionally that was, and I, yet I know that, God, you wanted to do something. So I was in conflict between spirit and soul, to say the least. I said, Holy Spirit, help me here. And I, when I asked him, I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm an electrician. And he was working at that time, he was working on the hospitals that were being rebuilt and remodeled. And then all of a sudden, I said to him, I said, what would possess a man working inside of an electrical panel box with voltage from 440? And I mean, it goes on up from there and just huge amount of commercial electrical power. And he said, well, I go over there and flip the breaker, make sure the breaker's off. And knowing a little bit, which is not much, I said, you're willing to stake your entire life 
up on a spring and a screw that holds that breaker in place. He said, well, you just have to believe. It's okay. When he said, I just, you just have to believe, I can remember his eyes become as big as golf balls. And the first thing that happened, he said, my God, what have I done? Before there was belief, I can't see what I'm doing, but once I believe, all of a sudden coming flooding through him, the Holy Spirit is, what have I done? Before that time, all the caseworkers and all the, the everybody that was dealing with him, even his uh, <clears throat> court-appointed attorneys, he just couldn't get it. He said, what have I done? And I said, the Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. That day, he prayed in my office and confessed Jesus as Lord. I went to court with him just to be, be there, and he got 55 years. He and I wrote back and forth, times from the, from the state penitentiary, down way down south, moved up closer. <clears throat> he just recently got out of prison. During while he was there, he earned four Bible degrees, started working in the chaplain's office, worked in the AIDS, wherever the, a lot of the guys that had AIDS in the infirmary, I guess. He was the, some of the last people that ever saw them alive. He was there and led many of those inmates to the Lord. <clears throat> You're talking about the spirit of redemption. The hardest thing he was was to continually forgive himself daily for all that he had done. Lost his, all of his family, lost everything, obviously. But he would write me these epistles. I beseech you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, no, has he gone religious on me? What is that? And he would share revelation about what he was getting out of the Word of God that was so with in-depth. He had learned to move beyond the circumstances surrounding his life into an encounter and a relationship with the Lord that delivered him from evil, brought him into a level of faith that not many people get there. I remember him writing me one time and says, I no longer see that I'm a prisoner of the, of the state of Texas. I'm a prisoner of Christ. I no longer see myself as incarcerated by man's ways, but I'm captured by the Spirit of God. And so it really, I began to look at this and entrust how God, how do you bring someone into this is because he began to move from a belief system into a faith system. I say this with all kindness as many of the Christians today, they believe, but they never move into faith. And faith is not what you believe. Faith is what you do. Faith is both a noun and a verb. Uh, you are a person of faith, that's a noun, but when you start living out and walking out the word, not just part-time fully, then you become a verb or a person of faith moving in action, and it takes you somewhere. Because faith needs the word of God to activate it, not just a theological belief in when people just believe in the word but never walk out that word, then it becomes, it's really a dead letter because the Pharisees believed. Jesus told them, you search the scriptures daily and they speak of me, but you wouldn't come to me. So the difference is the word is to draw us to him, not just to talk about him. So when the word of God becomes a lamp unto our feet, it becomes the lifestyle that we live it out not just when it's convenient, but when it, it crosses the grain of my soul, when my soul wants to act out, my soul wants to, you know, move out of its own uh, zone and where it's discerning out of, the, out of my mindset instead of out of my spirit, then, then we have conflict. The Bible tells us that the carnal man, that doesn't necessarily mean one who is full of perversion and sin, could be, but the carnal man is simply one who allows their their mind to rule over what God has said. I know the word of God says, but I choose to do this. So we're in conflict. And the conflict keeps us from ever entering in to the might and power of the spirit that performs miracles, that causes things to change and every, everything about us to begin to move from that point. 
So look with me in, the, in Romans, the fourth chapter. <clears throat> a couple of, maybe a couple of years ago, I don't remember doing a series called uh, The Currency of Heaven. Remember, remember that? Some of you remember that? I'm in the, right now in the process of writing that book after two years, spent the last three days working on it. And it's taken out of this, the idea of what Abraham, that when God came to Abraham and told him what he was going to do and what he promised him, and the Bible says, and it was accounted to him for righteousness sake. That word accounting stood out to me and just bugged me for days and days. And of course, you guys got to hear the series on it. So I went back and studied it in some detail to find out the word accounting in the original means exactly what it says. It's accounting. Logisma maya means literally like you would, a logistics, an inventory of something that belongs to you. In other words, God is saying, because Abraham you believed, I've opened an account up for you that there is in heaven because we know that there's rewards in heaven, but not only in, for the last days, but we can draw from that because as one, one lives out, walks out here on earth and deposits there, there's something that's released here. When we find the scriptures talks about given it shall be given, pressed down, shaken together, running over, you know, it's not only just for there, but it's you're depositing something for the now. If you follow the rest of the history with Abraham to any degree, you found out that God began to use Abraham's life in a very powerful way, become very wealthy and very powerful. God honored him so much so that he said, uh, I'm even going to let you in on my secrets. I call you my friend. So I want to suggest to you without going back and doing that teaching all again, that there is somehow another God has an accounting. I can take you through a lot of the parables and scriptures. The talents, one, three, and five, there was an accounting of that. And the one who hid the one, he was an accounting of that. He lost what he had, but the person that had the most, which proves to me God's not a socialist, the one that had the most, he takes the one and gives to that guy because it's according to our ability, not just the availability. What have we done with what's been given to us determines what more will come. God is always giving us something to see how it will increase. Everything he created was the idea that life in it will always grow and increase. Christianity was never to be a static position of a belief system. It was to be at that point a launching pad to where we walk out the full dimension of what the Word of God says we could and we could become. When we settle for just knowing a few scriptures, settle that I'm going to go to heaven one day, my name's written in the book of life, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it leaves us very powerless, only simply we believe in. Now, look in Romans, the fourth chapter, beginning verse 13. <clears throat> For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not, of Abraham, was, was not to Abraham. This is the history of Abraham. It goes back to how he's justified and, and so on. That the one that he would be would not be your heir of the world was not of Abraham, or to the seed through his would be the seed through the law and the old covenant of something on the outward that was just simply performed, but through the righteousness of faith. The righteousness of faith. Hang on to that. Faith is not the idea that you believe in something. Faith is the entry level that allows you to be born again, to awaken the inside of you. Then faith comes along. And starts working on what's been awakened inside of you to take you into a re to revelation of who Jesus is and the revelation how might and how powerful he is. But faith is not something we just simply believe in. Faith is a lifestyle that we walk out and see it demonstrated. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, I don't come to enticing words of men's wisdom, but in the demonstration and power of the Spirit. So it was never to be something I just had a mindset about or had information about as a historical fact, but it's something that i moving in so much so that it took me to the point of that. I was reading the history of our Memorial Day that was back during the Civil War. General Logan put it out as Decoration Day um, back in 1886, I think it was. But these people, these men of freedom, had vision so much so 
that they moved against all odds and all circumstances. Today we see Memorial Day that we're celebrating here as, you know, sometimes people go out to their, their family and all that. But it was a celebration of the courage of people that not only just believed in an idea, but it's so much that they put their life on the line and moved through things. Washington crossing the Delaware, all of those historical things against all odds, Valley Forge and all the things that were there, you can see God moving in behalf of that. You read the history of during the World War II when the Blitzkrieg was coming and, and uh, Churchill was calling for prayer. And the Germans were just bombing World War II, you know, and World War II just bombing England. My dad was stationed over there during that time. And just going at it. To where they threw it, they sent everything at, at London at one time. And they began to pray and call on the Lord. And they knew that they didn't have the defense or have the, the planes to, to outfight the, the, the mount that was coming. God brought up a, just out of nowhere, a fog bank. Amen. Of course, London's a little foggy anyway, but not. It just brought out this fog and just surrounded the Germans, that, that Luftwaffe, which just surrounded it, and they couldn't find their way. They didn't have radar, just only radio signal. And just surrounded it, and they had to turn back. It gave them a chance to regroup and to, to resupply. When we step into a place that, it's not just uh, we believe in something, but we believe the one whom we call upon the name of the Lord. He comes and answers in behalf of those who know him. So my point this morning is faith is not about an information or saying the right things. Faith is a relationship that is based upon having an encounter with Jesus. It's sad to say a lot of our, our faith system is based upon people preaching about it and saying step one, step two, and step three, you confess this, say this, do this, without ever having an encounter with the one who is the author and the finisher of faith. If faith began with him, it takes him to be able to impart faith to us. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Great statement. Nevertheless, the life I now live post-resurrection, post the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. We're in the post-resurrection, the faith of the Son of God. We're living where He's at. First John says, as He is, so are we in this present world. So we can draw from the faith of the Son of God right now in this, right now in this world. And how do we draw from that is to be able to look past the circumstances that set against us and our own happiness and how we feel and all the little trivia things that we get caught up in and begin to set our affection upon eyes above. Upon, set our affection upon on eyes, on things above. The, the word affection there literally means your thoughts, you, you, you set upon, you meditate upon, you look at. So he set your thoughts because whatever your thoughts on is the thing that you empower the most. Well, I fear this, I fear this, I'm fearing this, this didn't happen, that's that. So we set our thoughts upon it. And so we don't derive the faith of the Son of God that comes down, who's at the right side of the Father, imparting to us, encouraging us. The Holy Spirit is joined with him. So I'll take of what he said and I'll remind you of that. And saying, you have something inside of you that's out of this world. But yet the mind suppresses what the Spirit is wanting to release. All right, let me move on. Okay, but through this righteousness of faith, for if those who are of the law are heirs of faith, is made, then faith is void, and the promise is made of no effect. In other words, if we're just something that we just did on the outward, offer sacrifices, and yet the inside of us was, you know, we're just meaner than a junkyard dog, then the fact is, then our righteousness isn't based upon a new covenant or based upon faith, it's based on law. Because the law brings about wrath, for there is, where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is a faith that is, might be according to grace. Grace gets us there, but faith also opens up and allows us to see all that God has for us. Know the difference. It's the grace of God. We can't earn it. He paid the sacrifice. There's nothing I can make happen. But with, once I step through grace, then faith takes over and says, I want to take you into and show you all that he has in store for you. I have not seen ears heard, nor has it entered in the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. He stored some things up for us. It's in the storage, but faith gets there and helps us to unlock the, the account and locks the storage. All right. 
But the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. He's the one that God said, I, this guy, he believed God, there's account, accounting for. Verse 17, I have made you a father of many nations, and yet he hadn't even had a son yet. I've made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him, key, faith is always in the presence of God, always in the presence of the Lord. You can't manufacture faith. It has to be in the presence of the Lord that he's there. He's in himself to you, revealing himself about who he is, and in the revealing of who he is, his faith begins to kick in. In the presence of the Lord, there's fullness, there's faith there. Faith to look beyond the issue and the problem at the moment and look to see the solution, see the miracle that's coming. Right. He's the father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now notice, that's where faith is. If I had a title this morning, I'd say, Faith, the faith that brings things alive, delivering from, bringing dead things to life again. That's what faith is. So it's having things from life to the dead and cause those things which do not exist as though they did. Here's what belief is. Belief is, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe it's possible. I believe from my own mindset because when we, we come to the Lord, we believe it comes out of our mind. That's where it starts. I believe that he is, can save me. But when it never causes us to move beyond just a mindset and unlocks the Spirit of God inside of us, we don't go into that level that says count those things that are not as though they are. Now you're seeing things prophetically, not seeing the way they are, but you're seeing the, what the, that He's called us to do. We're seeing what His intentions are. We're seeing what He wants to do, not just stuck where we are. Most Christians only repeat what they believe. Here's what's happening to me in my life. This happened to me. They said this. We said that. And, that, and then so it all becomes so it creates a belief system. It's a file that is so logged into our brain that suppresses, becomes a carnality and suppresses our spirit. Yet our spirit is crying out, count those things are not though they are. Because in the spirit realm, they exist. But you're stuck in the, then what you see in the natural that are, and I want to take you into things that are not as though they are. So he releases our spirit that explodes inside of us. Now we're operating in a heavenly realm, not in an earthly realm. Because we tend to want to tell everybody how bad things are with me instead of saying how good God is. When our spirit begins to connect with heaven, let heaven and earth come together. There's a three that agree in heaven. There's three that agree in earth. When we start agreeing with heaven, our spirit comes alive and it takes more domination over our mind. And when your spirit becomes activated and alive, you find out you're less frustrated with the cares of life because now your mind is being dominated by your spirit, which was the original intent with God. God would come down, communicate with them. Everything's good. Well, there's a devil over in the corner. Yeah, but I'm here. Okay. And so they understood that God is greater than the devil. When they decided to peek outside of that and not trust God is when they got into trouble. Look at the rest of this. Who contrary to hope and hope believe. Now, hope comes out of your soul. In fact, Hebrews says hope is the anchor of the soul. It's having, I'm hanging on, believing for a better day, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but one has to move beyond hope into faith because faith moves you beyond the point of hope into the realities that I'm, just, I'm waiting for God to do it. Marcy had a word, held on the word. I'm going to keep pressing in, pressing in, pressing in, and until it was manifested. When we lose hope, it means that the mind is now taken over and it's easier to say, yeah. I'm sorry you're disappointed. It's just the way life is. Learn to live with it. Learn to live inside of your, of your mess. Yet the Spirit says, hollers out, no. You are related to the one that is sitting on the right side of the Father, and he is the author, but he'll also finish it. He's the completer of the faith. I just have to allow my spirit to become greater intensified than my mind. So when... 
Whatever, and you've heard me say it a million times, whatever we magnify, we empower. Whatever we spend time building up, making a case for, and talking about it the most, that means that's where my affection is. You can talk about something you don't like, but it still draws your affection. Draws your affection away from the Lord. So that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. He said, I want to talk to you about your future. But if you're so locked up in the present, you can't hear your future. Things present and things to come, not things of the past. Things present and things to come. Trust me for the present so you can get to where you things to come. Faith is all about leading you where you can go, not where you are. Now, when I was 19 years old, <clears throat> I, they gave me a, my pastor, a church where I was at. There's three of us guys in the church. I guess we had some promise on us for whatever reason that looked like. And they all gave us a card, put in our pocket, that we were now a licensed ministry. I think that was a, maybe like a bicycle with training wheels on, I'm not sure. <laughs> we thought we were really God's gift. Conferences would come around and they would let us sit on the platform. I'd go get a new seat or a new tie and we'd buckle that thing up and we have a card in our pocket and we're, we're something. Never had preached a message. Never had not spoken one time publicly except testimony among the few group. I was an armchair quarterback that critiqued everything everybody else did, but I never preached a message. That's what happens. The pastor came to me and he said, uh, I want you to preach next Sunday. Uh, Sunday night? A little smaller crowd? No, Sunday morning. So I was thinking all the reasons that, you know, I shouldn't be doing that. And I know there's a bunch of meat eaters in there, my mother being one of them. <laughs> so I, just, I was thinking about, how can I get out of this? The mind wants to find a way to keep your status without having to do it. It was more fun having a card and nobody knowing that you could fail before risking that you might fail. So I, I studied hard. don't even remember what I preached. Studied as hard as I could. Oh, God. Walked the floor. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. It came time. I got up. I fumbled around for a little bit. And all of a sudden, there was something that just kicked in. And I just felt a blanket just fall over the front of me. And I don't remember what I said, but I knew at that point, I see, the people that was in front of me ceased being there, and I ceased having him. And it was as if he was talking to me, and I was just relay, translating, relaying back to the people. I wasn't even looking. My notes had nothing to do with my notes, had nothing to do with any of those things. That day, the Lord spoke to me and says, you moved out of belief into faith, that you trusted me beyond what you could do yourself. Yeah. There's a point in time to where that we have to step out of our own stuff, our own trying to wrangle and manipulate and make it fit how we want to, to the point is, here I am, God, sink or swim, fall or fail, I'm here. I am no longer going to be just a guy with a card in his pocket. I've got to be able to do this stuff or back out of this one way or the other. Something has to break through. It is faith when you break through. When Moses brought the Hebrews out of uh, Egypt, he stretched his rod out, the Red Sea parted, they walked through on dry ground. The second crossing at Jordan, Joshua's in charge now, and God tells them, this time you're going to have to put your feet into the water. Take the priest carrying the ark and step into the water. In other words, before that time, it was one man, one rod, he did it all for everybody, and now it became, you're going to have to get wet. I want you to trust me, we don't know how deep they had to get before God kicked in, but something about it is I want you to be engaged and trust me even when things feel like it's closing in, even when you feel like, what if God doesn't answer? But I know that I'm supposed to do this. God may me not be answering. I may get right up to here and all of a sudden, whoop, he, there he is. Because faith that's never tested is really not faith. It's only beliefism. Until I was ever tested the idea about ministry, it was simply a beliefism. 
It was simply, it was easier to criticize and critique everybody else who, who did than the one when I had to step in and do it. Faith engages us in such a an hands-on empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we're no longer an observer what somebody else should be doing, but we're now engaged with what the Holy Spirit is doing. And he draws us in to where our spirit is made alive and we're more alive with that than, than if we were just reading about it. Now, let me finish up with this. Verse 19, here's the kicker. <laughs> This is what Paul says about Abram. Abram, not being weak in faith, he had not had a son yet, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body, circumstantial evidence, did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So when he got a word from God, you're going to have a son, immediately the mind, will, and intellect goes and listen, I'm a hundred years old. Look at my wife. Does she look like it's going to happen? He did not consider that. Faith does not consider the objection to the word of God. Faith takes us right into the point and saying, it's not my responsibility to make it happen. My responsibility is simply to walk and say, I agree. And move forward with it. And moving forward with it is where signs and wonders and miracles happen. But as long as we're on the outside and telling what everybody else should do, and yet we've never walked through that, then what happens is, is then we're, we're just in a belief system and never move into faith. Faith is where the dominance of the Holy Spirit pulls out the promises of God, everything that God says about us and to us, all of the potential is inside of us. One of the words for prophecy, we get prophesia, is the word potency. Genesis 3 said the life is in the seed. That's potency. In other words, locked up in a seed, whatever that seed would be, is the DNA of what that seed will reproduce. Not just a, an apple to an apple tree, but from there, orchards, whatever that your, your spirit can grab hold of and say, this is my destiny. Fear always locks us down Faith releases us because it's connecting. The devil has his dimension that's very contra. The devil doesn't know anything. You know, if he did, he would never crucify Jesus. So he's not omniscient, but all he knows is to do is to uh, duplicate, mimic what God does. So what faith does in the kingdom of God, fear does in the kingdom of darkness. What if this doesn't happen? What if this takes place? What if this? Then we are now giving faith, or fear if you will, to the kingdom of darkness, locks down what God is doing, and we're stuck in that realm. And that's all we can see. That's all we talk about. That's all that happens is that one, that one dimension. So to be released into the kingdom of God, then our spirit must be alive and released of that. Faith that's never tested and not just tested, but overcome, is never faith that releases to that level. We know the Bible talks about there's levels of faith, mustard seed faith, you know, if you had mustard seed, but the results are huge. So it's not about the size, it's the obedience to faith is. The potential is still yet to come, but we start at one point, start planting a seed, believing God, saying this Lord, and then beginning to dream big and allow the meditation of my heart, the words of my mouth, be accepted in your sight, O Lord. So that's beginning to move into the realm to where it's no longer seeable. <clears throat> I learned something this, this last year that's taken me a while to process. I was in um, Kentucky <coughs> ministering in a church there, a friend of mine. I think I may share the testimony here when I got back. At the end of the service, end of this was a, an anniversary service for a church. At the end of the service, I felt the quickening of the Lord saying, call for anybody that has cancer to come forward. Two older gentlemen came up, stepped forward. I prayed for one. The second one, something happened. I was no longer praying for his healing issues with cancer. 
All I did is start thanking Jesus as the Lord God who's the healer. Magnifying his name, magnifying who he is, magnifying how great and might and how powerful it is. That the children's bread is for healing. God, you've given us the bread for healing. And so I just started thanking the Lord for that. And I don't remember saying, I, don't, I didn't curse cancer. I didn't say anything about cancer one way or the other. I just, all I could see was Jesus. <clears throat> didn't mean I didn't love this other guy, have compassion. I didn't know either one of them. Flew back home Monday, Tuesday, I get a call. The pastor says to me, and he said, I got to tell you what happened. Remember those guys at the end of the service? I said, yeah. He said, well, one of them is on your left. I don't know which one he's talking about. Went in on Monday to have a, a PET scan for his follow-up. He had, was in fourth stage, it's either liver or, or pancreatic cancer, I don't remember. He looked pretty rough. He was going in for just a checkup, because this is what they do. Tell you, well, you're right on schedule to die. <clears throat> you're heading that way. Nothing we can do for you. And so the doctor said to him, you need to come back tomorrow. He lived about 100 miles away, and he went home come back. And because he told him, he said, the scan's not working today. <laughs> you know that story. He comes back the next day. They scan him again. A PET scan is a very, very thorough. I mean, it's head to toe. If there's any hot spot cancer in your body, that thing will flare out. And his doctor comes in and says, I don't understand this. Well, they never do when it comes to that kind of thing. I mean, he's been treating him for years, had done everything they could for him, and all of a sudden we can't find one hot spot in your body that has cancer. <clears throat> so I'm asking the Lord, the, uh, the other guy, I don't know what happened, don't, didn't hear any response from him, but there was something happened when my attention and focus was no longer on cancer, but it was upon the Lord. Yeah. And faith there, when you think about cancer, man, it'll suck faith right out of you. Whatever the issue is that you target, you set your, your mind of affection on, then that becomes, yeah, that's who's winning. But when you, all of a sudden, the things of who Jesus was became more paramount than the guy that was standing from me. I felt a little bad. I thought, man, I'm not even thinking about him so much. I'm just thinking the goodness of the Lord. And so when he says, heal the sick, he wasn't talking about go tell them about the illness because he didn't say pray for the sick, he said heal the sick. And the Lord is the healer. So when we magnify the healer over the sickness, something happens in the area of faith. So faith is not concentrating on the problem. Faith is concentrating on the one who gave us the faith. The faith of the Son of God is now post-resurrection. Not the faith of Abraham, not the faith of your, of your friend, your best friend, not the faith of some preacher that preaches on faith. It is the faith of the Son of God. So when we honor and worship Him, the ancients believed that whatever name they declared Him to be, that He would manifest Himself in the same name that they declared Him to be. Psalms 48 says, as His name is, so is His praise. So as we're worshiping and thanking Him as Jehovah Rapha, the, the Lord my, thy God and my healer, then what does he do? He manifests in himself healing. God in, introduces himself to the Hebrews the first time. They had never heard about Jehovah. They didn't know who Jehovah was. All they knew was the gods of Egypt. And he said, Moses says, I am the Lord thy God that heals you. And he said, I'm the Lord God that delivers you. I'm the Lord thy God's going to give you a better life. I'm the Lord thy God takes you to a better land. I am the Lord thy God he, that heals you. God wants us to see him yes. not as the healer, not just a physical healing, but the word sozo, saved, healed, delivered, is a complete thing. In other words, when you set your heart and your affection upon him and get it off on the cares of life, it means whatever you need, it is downloaded to you because faith released it to you. Now, when 1 John says, greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. Obviously, speaking to the Holy Spirit. Greater is He, the Holy Spirit, the one who's going to remind you of everything Jesus said and did, is inside of you. The Holy Spirit is not inside of you to remind you how bad things are or how bad everybody else is. That's a discernment out of our own mind. But He's come to discern, based upon post resurrection, all that He's saying. 
All that he said, this is the will in Christ Jesus concerning you. So we begin to see ourselves in a whole new the realm by practicing what he says and what he's saying instead of practicing all the issues and problems around us. So. All right. Look at me in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. The Hall of Fame chapter. But I'm Pick it up verse 6, then I'm going to jump back up. But without faith, the word faith there actually has a connotation of life inside of a pistas. It's, it's life itself. It's not a, a mental cognizant thing. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Doesn't say if I, if I believe in him, totally different word. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to him, comes to God, must believe that he is, and then that he is a rewarder. He has an account. He rewards faith. The rewarder of those who diligently seek him, which is a mind, which is not just a mindset, but it's the idea I'm searching out. I'm searching out the depths of who he is. Deep calls out and deep. I just don't know one on the surface level. I want to know the friendship and the relationship that faith comes out of. Faith is having the encounter of him. So when Abram says he believed him, not just believed in him, but he believed him, and God said, then, then I'll give you what I promised. But now you're operating in faith, which becomes a lifestyle. Just because I said, Lord, forgive my sins 20 years ago and then don't move anything, I haven't moved into faith. You see that in just a moment. The word, the word pleaser is an interesting word. It's very close to the word in the, in the Greek is for the word yes. So the original would say, without faith, it is impossible to say yes to God. Interesting, isn't it? So faith says yes to God. So unbelief says no to God. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. That I'm saying is, I know it's possible, but I'm saying no. I don't want to be disappointed, so I'm, I'm, I don't want to go too far. I don't want to get, jump too far in. I'm not going to be totally committed, so I'm saying no. We don't realize we're saying that. But to please the Lord means yes. Right. Diane could tell you <clears throat> a couple of years ago, the Lord said something to me just inside of me that exploded. I knew it when the devil talked to me that way because I wouldn't have liked it. I mean, I, I didn't like this so much either. He said, for the next two years, I want you to say yes to everything I'm asking you to do. My schedule filled up. It became horrendous, became so much so. I mean, I didn't say no to anybody or anything. I didn't say no to her at all. And so God, that was a God thing. <laughs> I'm still on that yes to her. <clears throat> it, it, something about that opened up understanding of the kingdom of God, the mysteries of the kingdom of God, and all the possibilities, not just possibility thinking, but living in such a peace of God in such a way that nothing would disturb or interrupt me from the outside. Oh, that's a little fox. Just get off me. I'm not going to take time to mess with it. There's that realm of the spirit to where your, your spirit is engaged with the Holy Spirit that supersedes all that you can ask or think or imagine according to the power Galatians 3.20, that works in you. What power is working in you? It's either unbelief or faith of the Son of God is working in us. We live according to the fullness, the power that's working in us. Which power is working in us? Both of them are very powerful. One takes you to darkness. The other takes you into the promises of the Lord that he had set for you from the very beginning, beginning of time. Now look back in verse 1. <clears throat> We've heard messages with this many times. Now, faith is the word substance. Hupostasis is the word. Hupo is a Jewish word. If you've ever been to a Jewish wedding, you've probably stood under that archway called a hupa. Hupa stasis. He said, now faith is standing underneath him, being covered by him. Faith is a covering. Unbelief is also a covering. It's a shroud of of darkness, it's a shroud of fear, it's a shroud of, of negativity, it's a sh shroud of cursing, it's a shroud of, of seeing things through that perspective. But standing on the hoopostasis is standing under the covering of God, 
engaged with who he is. So he tells us right out, faith has substance. It is a material, the one, original, one translation says. So faith has material, but it's not material for our mind. It's material engaged in our spirit. So faith is substance, hypostasis. It's of, of things hoped for. My mind is, is now not resisting. I'm hoping for it, but it's going to take my spirit to get it there. I can't logically figure out how God's going to do that. Anytime you start trying to figure out how God's going to fulfill a word to you, you miss it. Very few times. That's why I just quit planning what God's going to do. He surprises me all the time. So I'm trusting him for the details. Are we there yet? Daddy, are we there yet? When are we going to stop? Are we there yet? How are we? Trust me. Trust me. I'm driving. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, your intellect, and he will direct your paths. In all your ways, he'll direct your paths. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. Faith is the ability to see the unseen realm. When you're believing God for a miracle, everything around you sticks it in your face and says, see what I'm seeing? See what you're saying? Doctor's report says this. Everybody around you tells this. You know, oh, I had someone that had that disease. They suffered terrible before they died. Bless your heart. (laughs) So we give evidence of everything other than God. The Holy Spirit says, I want to get to you the evidence. If God said something to you and it's based on his word and you have plenty of that word, then you already have the evidence. The evidence is not what you see. The evidence is the hope in, or the, the spirit of faith inside of you, which causes you to begin to hope in the Lord. I have hope again because the spirit jumps up inside of you. I don't know how it is for other people, but I can read a verse of scripture and all of a sudden something inside of me leaps inside. That's the spirit of faith that's revealing something beyond what I'm seeing with the natural. And when you yield to that leap inside of you, then it transcends everything else around you and it becomes the bigger glory, the bigger expectation from that point. Proverbs 16 chapter and verse verse 7. I I love hanging on to this verse many times. When a man's ways please the Lord, remember please means, at least in the Greek side of it, when a man's ways please the Lord, it's saying yes to God. When a man's ways please the Lord, he even causes enemies to be at peace with him. I've got this strange little picture of like me trying to cross a bridge, get to the other side, and there's a troll living under the bridge, and he's exacting something from me. He, I have to pay the toll, the torment, and all that. But I have in my mind, because my ways please the Lord, and I've said yes to God, then this troll says there, and he wants to start harassing me, and I just keep walking. Give me, give me, give me, give me. I'm going I'm to kill you. I'm going to tell you. And I just keep walking on across the bridge, and he has to open the gate. He can't do anything else. Because there's an attraction from the demonic realm to mess with our minds, but there's a release of the power of the Spirit out of our innermost being flows rivers of living water out of our innermost being is the clap of the Holy Spirit that says there you go, walk in it and don't look back and don't fear what man can do. Do not fear what evil can even do to you. Romans 14 goes into a lot more detail with this. But he said, whatever is not of faith is sin. Think about it. When you see what hypostasis means, you're standing under this. If I move out underneath the hypostasis or the faith of the Son of God and I start doing it on my own, retaliating revenge and doing my own thing, then I've stepped out of faith and now I'm operating what I believe. When you're under the hypostasis, you're submitted under the covering of the Most High God. You can go into Psalms 91. He that dwells under the shadow of the Most High God, he shall say of the Lord, he is my refuge. No evil shall befall me there. The word shadow there, translated to Islam, is literally the thoughts of the Lord. He that dwells under the thoughts of the Lord, he will be able to say this and mean it and believe it because he lives and dwells and exists there. All right, I've got to finish up. Just allow the Holy Spirit... to take you into the realm of, this, of, of where he is. 
James, the second chapter, verse 17 through 26. He really describes this pretty, pretty thoroughly. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it's dead. It's not, faith is not a static, it's moving. It's what I do that causes it to be faith. Not just having the noun, but having the verb. I'm believing him, I stand in what he says, and now I've got to move in it. This by itself, if it does not have works, it's dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. It's by the working of what the Word of God says that, de that deposits in your favor and in your account as an accounted unto you because of faith. Faith activates that account. Now, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. If all of I do is believe, then all I've done is come up to a demonic level. Kind of rough, isn't it? I can believe, which is the awakening of my mind, and now my innermost being needs to kick in and say, he is the Lord God, creator of the universe. I believe more than just he's my savior. I believe everything he said to me, personalized promise, and that he will do it. Amen. He's able to do it all the way through. Everything I've committed to him, he's able to finish it, do it. I don't have to dig up the seed and wonder, does it look like it's growing much? I don't know. How it grows, I don't know. It's not my job. My job is to plant it, sow it, and water it, and praise God for it. Amen. And move on from there. But, but, do you what, but do you want to know, O foolish man or unlearned man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that, that faith was working together with him? By works, faith was made perfect. Look down at verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead. That's how you can tell when someone's dead. Their spirit's got gone. If they could do a check, find out if your spirit's gone, then they would, that's how when they know you're dead. The body without the spirit, because the spirit is electrical, it's life, it's light. Everything that keeps us alive is your spirit. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Your body may be quick working, but if your spirit's still inside, his, your spirit will rise up to heal, reconstitute, and do what God said. So, Father, this morning we present ourselves before you. God, asking, Lord, that you would take us beyond what we've ever thought about faith before. And that you would move in our life in such a way that we would allow the innermost being, the spirit part of us, to be activated and come alive. That conviction comes in your spirit, not in your mind. Your mind will bring condemnation. Your spirit will bring conviction. And conviction always leads you to a solution and to healing. Condemnation is suppressing. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, that you didn't come in the world to condemn us, but you came inside of us to convict us, to convince us that there's more that you want to do in our lives than just simply breathe in and breathe out. Forgive us, Lord, the times that we've, with our own mind, gave up on you. With our own mind, we said it should be this way or should be that way. And we tried to, we tried to choose our own path and plot it out. And when you didn't go the way we were wanting you to go, we were disappointed. We give up all of our disappointments for your appointments today. To bring healing in our souls, Lord, that causes our spirit to be oppressed. But we ask the Holy Spirit to impress our spirit. That we move beyond just what our mindsets think and our opinions are worthless. Our, our, our opinions resist the will of God. So today, Father, would you just arm us with a greater infilling of the Spirit of God to loose the Spirit of the living God inside of our spirit. The eternal part of us, not the temporal part that dies and goes away, but our spirit's coming alive eternally. 
Stand with me, you would please. <coughs> down for just a little bit. If you're struggling with something that's, that your mind just keeps taking precedent over, today is the opportunity to crucify that so that He, the Spirit of God, can live and dwell and exist through you and out of you. You'll be continually disappointed until you let Him become become Lord and how you feel and how you think is not discernment it's just confusion based upon our past experiences Holy Spirit just come upon us wash us clean from all of the experiences that says one thing into the power of the Holy Spirit that releases us to be like your liking. In Jesus' name, amen.